Hi class, uh, welcome to this week. We are talking about lung and thorax examination. It's important before we start to examine the uh, chest anatomy that we understand some of the underlying structures and make sense of uh, what you're listening to um, and from an anatomical standpoint. So let's go over some of the basic chest anatomy that's identified um, in this picture. So it's important to note first where the intercostal spaces are and how they're numbered. The, the intercostal spaces is that area between the ribs. They are numbered by the rib above it. So the second intercostal space, or the second ICS, ICS is intercostal space, the second ICS is below the second rib. So how do you know where the second rib is? You can start by finding that suprasternal notch just between the clavicles, and then below that is the manubrum, uh, and the horizontal bony ridge beneath that is the angle of Louis, also called the sternal angle. Um, just lateral, so if you move your fingers lateral after you find that, um, lateral to the sternal angle is the second rib and costal cartilage. From here, you can walk your fingers up or you can walk your fingers down through those inner spaces. You probably won't be able to count the inner spaces in the lower edge of the sternum because you can see here that the ribs are too close together. Um, here, you'll need to move your fingers kind of laterally around the ribs uh, a little bit more laterally and continue to count down. This information allows you to document accurately based on rib numbers. So um, if you're saying that there's point tenderness at a particular area, you don't want to just say point tenderness in the right chest wall. Well, that's a <laughs> pretty large place. So try to narrow down exactly which rib you're talking about. And you can do this by count, finding the intercostal space and walking your fingers up or down in those inner spaces to the particular rib. Um, there are other... Uh, clinical significance findings with these. and So what happens really um, here at the second intercostal space? What typically is inserted um, here at the second intercostal space? This isn't really for primary care, uh, but for those uh, nurses that are um, inpatient, with inpatient experience. Yeah, the second intercostal space is the insertion for attention pneumothorax. Uh, what about the fourth intercostal space? This is where chest tubes, right? Chest tubes are inserted there. So you can see from this picture that the costal cartilage of the first seven ribs, they articulate to the sternum. So they kind of meet up with the sternum. But the eighth, ninth, and tenth rib are all attached to the costal cartilage above them. The eleventh and twelfth ribs down here are f uh, floating, which means that they don't have any anterior attachments. The tip of the eleventh rib can usually be felt laterally, and the twelfth rib the tip of it might actually be felt posteriorly, so posterior laterally or so. Um, if you're counting uh, in the posterior thorax, you can start at the 12th rib and then count up and palpate for the inferior tip of the scapula, um, sorry, or, or um, palpate for the inferior tip of the scapula, which generally usually lies around the 7th rib or the 7th inner space. So that, that gives you some ideas of how to um, count ribs, how to find which rib you're talking about. These next couple pictures that we're going to show um, will help with your documentation. So you want to use these lines to help describe your findings and the location of your findings. Some of the lines are precise lines. You know, the mid-sternal line um, is pretty concrete. We can see where the sternum is. You can kind of see right down the middle of the anterior chest. Other lines are uh, more estimated. Um, like the midclavicular line, which is approximately halfway between uh, the clavicle. There are also posterior lines as well as um, the vertical line and the scapular line, which drops down from the inferior angle of the scapula, which we don't show here. But the main ones that you're going to want to um, know are the midsternal line, the midclavicular line, the anterior axillary line. This line right here, this anterior axillary line, corresponds to this, this same one right here. This is the anterior axillary line. And then here you have the mid-axillary line and then the posterior axillary line. Um, other general an anatomic terms that you'll want to be aware of for um, when we're talking about the chest findings is supraclavicular. Supraclavicular is this area above the clavicles. And then infraclavicular, below the clavicles. Interscapular is between the scapulae, so it's on the posterior chest wall, which there is in the picture here, but on the posterior chest wall is infrascapular, or sorry, interscapular, which is between the scapula, and then infrascapular, which is below the scapula, uh, and then the base of the lungs, which is the lowest most portion of the lungs. Uh, 
different than what the base of the heart is, which we'll talk about, I think, next week. This picture then shows the lobes um, and how they correspond in the chest wall and the, and the location of the lungs. So from this picture, you should be able to see that anteriorly, you can hear all the lobes of the lungs, but only a little of the right and left lower lobe. The posterior aspect of the chest is mostly lower lobe, uh, but you can see that the parts of the upper lobe are able to be assessed from the back as well. So on the posterior chest wall, most of, of what you're getting is lower lobe, the right lower lobe, and the left lower lobe of the lung, a little bit of the upper lobe here. This makes more sense when we look at it laterally, um, because you can see that the fissures here um, separate the lung. It's not, you know, it's not an X here. You actually have some um, horizontal or oblique fissure lines. So it's important as you assess the lobes of the lungs that you keep this picture in your head uh, to reference so you can imagine which lobe you're listening to and where you're listening. Each lung is divided roughly in half by the oblique major fissure. So it's not up and down or horizontal, it's oblique, right? Slices kind of at an oblique angle. The right lung is then further divided by the horizontal or the minor fissure here. So there's three lobes on the right lung and only two lobes on the left lung. From the lateral aspect, so underneath the armpits, you can hear all the different lobes of the lungs, which means, you know, which makes this a very important area to uh, listen to, one that a lot of people often forget. Um, a little bit about the uh, physiology of breathing, which um, really is an autonomic act. It's controlled by the brain stem. It's mediated by these muscles of respiration, the biggest one being that dome-shaped diaphragm, which is the primary muscle of inspiration. When it contracts, it descends in the chest and enlarges the thoracic cavity. A lot of people, a lot of students kind of mix this up in their heads. They know that when you take a deep breath, your diaphragm contracts, but for some reason when we say the word contracts, they think that it you know, comes up. But it's really important to remember that when the diaphragm contracts, it actually goes down and creates more room in the chest and enlarges the thoracic cavity, which is how then um, that passive air can be kind of inhaled. At that same time, as the diaphragm uh, contracts, it compresses the abdominal contents, which pushes the abdominal wall outward. So you see some people whose abdomens go out when they take a deep breath in. During inspiration, the muscles contract, the thorax expands, and then the interthoracic pressure decreases, which draws air through those tracheobronchial trees into those alveoli, those small um, little air sacs, and that expands the lungs. The expiratory phase follows immediately. So the chest wall and lung recoil, the diaphragm relaxes, and the rise um, is more passive. Air flows outward and the chest and abdomen return to that resting uh, position. So now let's see that um, we've had that little refresher on some of the anatomy and physiology stuff. We'll start getting into the health history. Um, you know, why do we assess the lung and thorax? What common complaints, what clinical complaints will patients come in for that should trigger you to assess their lungs? Um, here's a few of them, but again, these could be um, a whole lot more. So when the patient has complaint of cough, shortness of breath, chest pain, wheezing, hemoptosis, which is that blood streak sputum, uh, in kids they might, um, you might see them brought in for nasal flaring, use of accessory muscles, uh, retractions, poor feeding, irritability, um, but a lot of times cough, shortness of breath are kind of the big ones. These are just a, some of the symptoms, there could be a lot more, things like dizziness, um, peripheral edema, you know, swelling in your feet. You probably should also assess the lungs and thorax. If it's congestive heart failure, you might hear some, um, some crackles or some um, moist lung sounds. Uh, you could, you really should um, assess the lungs and the thorax almost any time you are assessing um, the cardiac structure. So uh, it kind of goes hand in hand, right? Pulmonary, cardiopulmonary. So any cardiac problem, also assess the lungs. Any lung problem, also assess the cardiac structures. Um, when I was, oh, I was probably, it was probably a year or so ago, but I saw this patient who um, had recently come out of the hospital, and uh, she had a long extended hospitalization. She was back in the facility that I was rounding at, 
Um, and I had had her, I had her on my agenda to, or scheduled to see the following day, but she, since she came in that day, I went over and said hi to her and just to tell her that I was going to come in the next day and actually see her and review everything with her. But, uh, we ended up talking and chatting and I, I probably sat in there for a good 45 minutes, just talking story with her and, um, talking about, you know, her hospitalization and answering some of her questions and, um, after the end of that, you know, that took probably 45 minutes I was in there with this lady. At the end of talking with her, she, I went to leave and she said, Honey, aren't you going to listen to my heart and lungs? And at that moment I thought, man, this could have been such an easy visit. All she really wanted was me to come in and listen to her heart and lungs because then she feel, she would have felt like, you know, she got something. You know, a provider came in, they listened to heart and lungs, and that's really what, you know, what our role is. So I spent all this time talking to her and, you know, doing what I thought was this therapeutic communication when she really just wanted me to listen, you know, the, the, um, she really wanted me to listen to her heart and lungs. So I tell students a lot of times, listen to everybody's heart and lungs. Even if they're there for toe pain or plantar fasciitis, um, listen to their heart and lungs. It makes them feel like, they got something out of it, and it also will help you kind of pick up on um, on any problem that they may have. Because a lot of times, you know, between that 20 and 40 year old, uh, they may not get their heart and lungs listened to if they don't come in for their wellness visits and if they only come in for episodic things. So take that moment to take a listen to uh, heart and lungs. Okay, so here are some of the common diagnoses that you'll encounter, um, and things like asthma, bronchitis, COPD, croup which is uh, mostly in pediatric patients, congestive heart failure, which is mostly in elderly patients, epiglottitis, mostly in kids, uh, GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease, can be across the lifespan, um, lung cancer, pneumonia, pulmonary embolisms, uh, pneumothorax, upper respiratory infections, tuberculosis, and tracheomalacia um, are some of the um, common conditions that you will um, be assessing for. So um, when you are taking a health history for someone who has a respiratory issue, they come in for a respiratory issue, you're going to ask them, obviously, all the old CART questions. You know, when did it start? Where exactly is it located? How bad are your symptoms? Uh, what's the duration? When, you, when this occurs, when these coughing attacks occur, are they, do they last all night? Are you able to sleep? Things like that. What have you tried? Um, so do your old CART, your good old CART, your symptom analysis. And then above and beyond that, you'll want to ask about any travel that they've done recently, uh, if they've had any sick contacts, you know, um, did this kind of go around their house already, um, and then their immunization status as well. Some of your pertinent positives and negatives um, related to lung and thorax conditions are going to be constitutional, so you're going to ask about fever, chills, night sweats, uh, weight loss. You're going to ask, obviously, the respiratory system, cough, shortness of breath, smoking history, hemoptosis, um, dyspnea on um, exertion. You'll ask about um, cardiovascular issues like chest pain, edema, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. Um, you'll ask about GI issues like abdominal pain or heartburn, which could lead you down the you know, GERD or gastroesophageal reflux disease pathway. You'll ask about musculoskeletal issues, costochondritis and rib fractures are two uh, really common causes of um, chest pain and um, in kind of younger um, people who don't have kind of the, the normal um, chest pain patterns. When you're um, asking about the past medical family social history, some areas are going to be more pertinent. Pertinent, So these ones you will want to include, even in an episodic note, you know, for that patient that just comes in for cough. You, w you should ask them about chronic or recurrent lung diseases. Have they ever had been diagnosed with asthma, bronchitis, COPD, uh, tuberculosis? Uh, you'll ask about cardiac diseases like CHF, international travel. Ask about uh, personal history, uh, smoking history, occupational exposures. Um, other exposures that they may have, and a family history of early COPD, which, um, you know, the alpha antitrypsin defect often gets misdiagnosed with COPD in younger people, so you can ask about uh, other family histories of chronic respiratory dis diseases or this alpha antitrypsin defect. If you identify that someone has some tobacco dependence, um, smoking um, dependence, you can offer them the tobacco cessation hotline um, and just give them some support and some documents and reassess um, 
make sure that you put a note, you know, to reassess this every visit. You're not badgering the patient, just asking them, hey, are you ready to quit? Hey, are you still smoking? Are you ready to quit yet? And let them say yes or no and then, then move on. But don't badger people, but you do need to address it and just let them know that, um, you know, give them the um, opportunity to get help. Other immunizations under health maintenance that you'll want to consider for kiddos is RSV, um, DTaP, HIB, um, the PVC, which are, these are all common, uh, RSV not so much, but the rest of them are very common um, pediatric immunizations that are, occur at regularly scheduled, inter regularly scheduled intervals. RSV, I'm not sure if they give it here as much in Hawaii, um, but I know on the mainland uh, in the winter months, in the winter months we used to give it and to preemies. Um, Tdap, you should ask about um, if they've had their Tdap. Um, this is now recommended for all, all adults who have contact with infants, including daycare workers and healthcare workers and grandparents and parents. Um, so it, it does not only booster for the, um, the tetanus and diphtheria, but also for the pertussis. Uh, recommend influenza vaccinations every year for those greater than six months old, and then the pneumococcal vaccination as well for um, elderly patients over the age of 65. And that's usually just a one-time dose. When you're seeing children uh, for a respiratory issue, uh, you'll want to ask some of these um, questions which are pretty specific just to children, but uh, their gestation at birth, their NICU, and um, uh, if they had a NICU stay and any meconium aspiration, Ask about respiratory infections, daycare use, or immunization status if they're an infant or toddler. And then, um, again, in toddlers, also ask uh, nasal congestion um, if they have that kind of nasally speech. If they have a history of allergy or uh, dermatitis or e like eczema, um, that kind of atopic picture that uh, there's that those three those three things conditions all uh, go together in this atopic sort of picture. So it's allergies. Um, atopic dermatitis, also called eczema, and then um, allergy, uh, sorry, asthma. So asthma, allergies, and atopic dermatitis, the three A's, kind of go together in that picture, that kind of atopic picture. So they have asthma-like symptoms and snoring and things like that. Okay, so for the examination, there's, um, it's helpful to examine the thorax while the patient is sitting. In a supine patient, you might have them roll on one side, and if able, um, you can... Um, examine the posterior thorax by having them roll both ways. Um, it's also helpful to try to visualize those underlying lobes, those first couple pictures we showed, uh, and then compare right siding, sided findings to those on the left so that the patient sort of becomes their own control. You know, if they're having wheezing on the right, make sure you're listening to both right and left. That way you're listening for both areas. It's really important to develop a system that works for you. So whether that is to observe, then palpate, then percuss, um, and then listen to the posterior thorax first, and then do all of that on the anterior. Um, versus some people like to observe the anterior and posterior, then palpate the anterior and posterior, then percuss the anterior and posterior, and then listen to the anterior and then the posterior. Um, I tend to do um, everything sort of on the anterior side first, and then everything on the posterior side. Um, but it's just really important to develop a system that works for you. It's really important to always inspect the thorax and chest, always auscultate the lung fields, but percussion and palpation may not always occur. You need to know the difference between a limited lung exam and that expanded lung, lung exam, and use your clinical reasoning to decide which parts of the exam to do and which, if any, to omit. So I often, you know, in almost every patient, I observe, so inspect, I inspect and then listen, auscultate. I don't always palpate and percuss, but sometimes you will. So two areas that I generally, I see students make these errors a lot is they listen to the lungs on top of clothes. That is not correct. Lungs should always be listened to under clothing, especially if there's a problem. You know, if there's a condition, if they come in for a respiratory problem, you really need to be listening to the lungs underneath the clothes. Uh, so that you're not hearing adventitious sounds that aren't really there. If you're just listening to someone's lungs to, to keep them happy or to appease them and, and just to kind of go through the motions but you don't really need to, then okay, maybe, whatever. But um, if you're actually trying to listen to something, make sure you're listening underneath the clothes. Also, listen um, 
I see students often just listening to the posterior thorax and they skip the anterior or the lateral aspects or vice versa. They'll only listen to the anterior. You know, in a patient that's laying down, they might just listen to the anterior and they skip the lateral and the, um, and the uh, posterior. So remember to make sure that you're listening to all the different lobes and you can't do that usually by listening to only one area. Okay, so first observation. Observation is pretty easy. You're just looking at the patient. You know, are, there, are their lips blue? Are their extremities cold and blue? This might tell you that there's an oxygenation problem. Uh, look at their breathing. Look at the effort, the rate, and the rhythm of their breathing. Some things that we see often in, um, uh, in end of life is shame strokes. Um, this is those kind of apneic periods and then where they have uh, some rapid breathing and then they kind of go apneic for a while. This is also seen in um, traumatic brain injury patients, um, might be seen somewhat normally in patients during high altitudes, um, metabolic acidosis, or I mean metabolic encephalopathy, sometimes due to acidosis, but uh, can also be, um, can present that way. Um, the Kuzmal is that kind of deep labor, labored and gasping um, breath. This is, um, uh, you know, that breathing of someone who just, you know, went sprinting down the road. That's, I mean, they'll, they'll have some Kuzmal um, breathing, which in that case would be normal, but it can also be abnormal as well and can be associated with uh, metabolic acidosis and other things as well. The most common cause of metabolic acidosis um, usually going to be related to diabetes, diabetes um, diabetic ketoacidosis, but can also happen in uh, kidney failure as well. Uh, the pediatric respiratory rate, um, you probably already know this, but newborns breathe faster. So they just breathe faster and, and that's normal for them. So a newborn might breathe 30 to 60 times per minute. Um, by the time they are you know, six years old, they should be breathing about the same as adults between um, you know, 16 to 20, 12 to 20. Somewhere in that range is, is going to be normal. When you're inspecting, you'll um, inspect the thorax for the shape of it. So normally the AP diameter is less than the lateral chest diameter, and there shouldn't be any deformities. Common deformities um, or common abnormalities of thorax are things like uh, barrel chest, which can in indicate um, COPD, pectus escabatum, which is a depression in the sternum. I think there's some pictures coming up of this. And then pectus carinatum, which is the sternum um, that is anterior displaced. Both of these things are relatively common, and um, but they occur in a, a in a continuum of severity. So if it's mild, then uh, it doesn't cause a problem for for patients. Other than sometimes patients are, get a little bit concerned about um, you know the cosmetic aspects of it being, especially here in Hawaii, have going shirtless and uh, in bathing suits all the time. But um, to a more when it becomes more of a problem is when the depression is significant enough to displace some cardiac structures. Um, kyphoscoliosis is abnormal curvature and rotation of the spine, so not just scoliosis, but the kyphoscoliosis, so it's a curve and a rotation. And then flail chest, which hopefully you'll never see in primary care, but those of you that end up um, in acute care, you might see this is a, a life-threatening uh, condition that usually you'll see in emergency department or trauma fields um, when a segment of the rib cage breaks under um, usually extreme stress, and it becomes detached from the rest of the chest wall. Usually this is going to be a segment of ribs, not just, you know, one rib that's kind of a flail rib, but more like, you know, three to four ribs that all break kind of at the same area. Um, and the um, rib then moves paradoxically for the chest. So uh, it moves opposite direction as the rest of the chest. So when the chest expands, that section kind of depresses. And when the chest recoils and the chest falls, that area, um, that flail chest um, uh, comes out. Um, so it has this paradoxical movement and can cause a lot of um, pain, increases the work of breathing um, significantly. Here's a picture of that pectus escavatum. You can see the depression right here in the chest. And then pectus Carinatum is the opposite of that, is the anterior displacement of that sternal area. Here's a picture of kyphoscoliosis. So you can see here that the spine is not only twisted or curved, you can see the curvature here, but it's also rotationally twisted, right? So it's twisted in this way. In this case, it looks to be twisted um, 
counterclockwise, and that's causing this side of the, of the cage to be elevated. And here's a picture of um, the normal chest wall versus the barrel chested wall. So um, here you're looking at the anterior posterior diameter. So this diameter right here, and you can see here is enlarged, right? It looks more like a barrel, kind of a four by four or a two by two, right? This guy should have a, um, he should be wider when you're looking at his lateral from, you know, from un underarm um, lateral axilla area to the other underarm lateral axilla area. So that lateral diameter should be greater than the AP diameter. Does that make sense? If it's not, you end up getting this sort of circular barrel chested look. All right, so after you inspect, you should palpate. You should palpate the anterior and posterior chest and thorax, assess for tenderness in the thorax and ribs, uh, localized point tenderness is common with rib fractures or rib bruising. Um, usually patients have a history that is suggestive of that um, also. Um, you might find, um, probably in primary care, you won't see any subcutaneous crepitus, but you're potentially in a recently discharged hospital patient, you might see that kind of when you're pushing on the chest wall, you get that sort of snap, crackly, pop. Um, sound. Uh, you can fill for uh, and look for sinus tracts, which are these kind of blind inflammatory tube-like structures that open to the skin. Usually can be caused by a deep infection that tunnels its way to the surface, but there's also some of those sinus tracts that are remnants of um, fetal development, and they can become inflamed and infected and drain after that. So um, it's relatively common. I mean, you, you know, you, you'll see it a, a few times um, throughout your careers. You can also um, palpate for uh, tactile summitus and respiratory excursion, which is that chest expansion. We'll talk about those. Chest expansion, um, these are all on your video as well, on your YouTube video, um, your skills lab video. And these, so chest expansion should be symmetrical. Uh, if it's not, then consider some bronchial obstruction. Usually it has to be pretty significant for you to be able to pick it up um, on inspect, I mean, on palpation. So, uh, pleural effusions, pulmonary fibrosis, things like that can decrease the lung movements and decrease the chest expansion. So, here is um, the technique there, but again, it's on your video as well. Tactile fremitus is those palpable vibrations uh, which are transmitted through the bronchial pulmonary tree when someone speaks. Um, you'll want to feel for the symmetry and the quality. It should be um, you know, equal on both sides, so feel for it being increased or decreased. Uh, if someone has a very soft voice, it's going to be very hard to feel for this, so make sure that they're, that they're um, you know, speaking up. Um, and other, uh, other conditions that interfere with the transmission of the vibrations from the larynx to the surface of the chest, things like COPD, um, an obstructed bronchus, pleural effusions, fibrosis, air, like a pneumothorax, uh, or a tumor, um, or just a really, really thick chest wall, someone who is kind of thick, you know, either mus muscle-wise, so they have a lot of muscle, anterior chest muscle or posterior chest muscle, or a lot of, your know, larger body habitus can be a um, barrier there. Uh, the technique here, um, you can use the ball or the ulnar surface of your hand, have the patient talk or say 99 as you palpate, and um, the technique is demonstrated for you in your YouTube video. Obviously, you shouldn't be able to feel fremitus below the diaphragm, right? Because the vibrations are gone there, right? Percussion takes a lot of practice. You need to make sure that you practice, practice, practice. Palp, uh, percuss everything you can. We'll practice this in lab as well. But review the video for um, technique and then practice away. Palpate, or I mean, percuss your abdomen and your hip bone and your chairs and your, you know, anything that is around you, your books and help uh, percuss each other. Uh, areas to percuss and areas to auscultate. This outlines a good pattern, uh, which looks like this ladder pattern, right? That way you're always comparing right to left or left to right, right to left, left to right, making sure that the patient becomes their own control. Same thing on the front side, right to left, right to left. If you hear something abnormal or you think you hear something abnormal, listen to the area around it. You don't have to stick to these. These aren't hard spots. You don't need to memorize these spots. You know, there's what, 14 spots on the back of the chest. You don't need to memorize these. Same with these. You don't need to memorize these. Just make sure that you're listening um, both sides, right to left, and listening to all the different lobes of the lungs. 
diaphragmatic excursion. Um, you can see again the video for our technique. Um, this is really looking at the volume that the person can take a deep breath in and out. Obviously, it's not going to be very, um, very sensitive. So it's not like a pulmonary function test where you can just measure the FEV1 or something. So, uh, but make sure that you are, um, you know, this is a, can be a potentially good tool um, for for um, people who don't have pulmonary function tests and you want to make sure and see if there is an um, abnormality yeah, from one side to the other or just in general. With diaphragmatic excursion, you're basically assessing the change in the diaphragm between inhalation and exhalation. So you have the patient take a deep breath in, you find the diaphragm border by percussing down to where it goes from tympanic to dull, and then you have the patient take an ex, um, to exhale and hold their exhale, and then you mark that area again. And then you're going to be able to see the change um, in their, in their um, diaphragmatic excursion. When you are listening to lungs, uh, this is sort of that bread and butter part, right? This is what everybody uh, thinks of when they think of, oh, the lung exam. All you have to do with the lung exam is, is auscultate, but um, not really, right? You need to inspect. You might need to percuss and palpate and then um, auscultate as well. But when you're auscultating, make sure you're using the diaphragm of the stethoscope. Um, have the patient take deep breaths through their mouth is best. You're going to hear um, better uh, sounds through their mouth. And follow the same pattern for auscultation that you use for percussion, comparing the right to left, and try to listen to at least one full breath in each location. Um, if you hear a suspicious sound or uh, an absence of a sound, like you don't hear any breath sounds, listen to the adjacent areas of the chest wall. Um, and then make sure that you're in tune to your patient's needs. So if you see them, um, you know, getting dizzy when you're having them breathe in and out, take a, re take a break and allow the patient to rest in between breaths. Normal lung sounds are uh, going to be um, these four different types of, um, of lung sounds. Most commonly, you're going to hear vesicular sounds. These are heard over most of the lung fields. They're soft, low-pitched. The bronchovesicular, you might hear more anterior in the upper part of the chest wall between, um, between the first and second interspaces, and then between the scapula posterior. These are, have a, um, they're a little bit louder. They have an um, increased uh, pitch and intensity. Bronchial sounds are heard over the manubrium. They're loud, they're high-pitched, but not as loud and harsh as tracheal sounds, which are heard over the trachea. So practice these things in lab. Um, so hearing it is the first step, and then the second step is now describing it. So this is the part that's harder for students. They're really great at listening. They know that, hey, this doesn't sound right, or I hear something weird. But now you have to try to describe what, uh, what you heard. So to do that, you need to... Um, describe where exactly you heard it, and when are you hearing it? Where in the timing of the patient's breathing are you hearing this? Are you hearing wheezes that are at the end of inspiration, or are you hearing wheezes that are at the very end of expiration? Are they throughout expiration? And then how much are you hearing? Is it fine crackles, coarse crackles, um, you know, things like that? And then where, location-wise, is it at the base, the middle, the superior, the right, the left, the mid-axillary line, the anterior axillary line, uh, things like that. So make sure that you're able to uh, describe it. The different adventitious lung sounds, the basic ones are going to be crackles, wheezes, and ronchi. Crackles are these um, intermittent, brief, non-musical um, sounds that, that are um, kind of like crunchy. You know, fine crackles are soft. They're very high-pitched. They're very brief. They kind of feel like, you know, the hair that is being uh, rubbed between two fingers in front of your ear. It's kind of like a soft little, um, you know, soft little crunchies, crunchy sounds. That's a terrible description, I'm sure. But coarse crackles are going to be louder, usually lower pitch and brief. Um, you might hear crackles commonly in a patient who's been lying down, so your hospitalized patients or your um, SNF or, or um, uh, nursing home patients. They should clear when the patient coughs a little bit and get those um, secretions up and open up those alveoli. Uh, crackles are really commonly associated with pneumonia, with CHF, less, ext less with bronchitis because usually with bronchitis we think airway obstruction or... Um, or airway narrowing, so then we think more wheezes and, and ronchi. So, okay, so, um, sorry, ronchi. Uh, 
These are um, longer, more musical sounds. They're kind of like a wheeze, but they're kind of a in between a re wheeze and a crack and a crackle. They're sort of um, low pitch, like snores. There, uh, you hear them more around the manubrium and, and um, tracheal, and even in out into the vesicular areas. But they um, are associated more with kind of those large airway secretions. But they're more snoring, kind of those harsher sounds in the lungs that aren't crackles, and they're certainly not wheezes. Wheezes are these continuous musical prolonged sounds. Uh, they're a little like, you know, um, hissing or shrill quality to them, really commonly associated with asthma, COPD, and bronchitis. You can do a special test called a transmitted voice sound, and this is looking at um, the, um, the voice resonance through the lungs. So uh, with increased transition of voice sounds, um, then that suggests that the air-filled lung has become airless, airless, meaning something has replaced the air in the lungs. Um, there are three transmitted voice sounds um, that you could do when you suspect lung pathology or if you hear an abnormal sound located in the uh, bronchovesicular or the bronchial breath sounds. So you can test for bronchophony, you can test for egophony, and you can test for uh, whispered proctoquiloquy. So I think we um, talk about those coming up. But So um, the first one is bronchophony. So here you can have the patient say 99, 99, 99. And you're moving your stethoscope around the chest wall as the patient's saying that. Normally, you might hear the patient saying 99, but it should be muffled and indistinct. Um, if it, there's abnormal sounds, if there are, um, if there sounds are louder and more clear, then that can indicate consolidation because remember sound travels better through um, through a medium than through no medium, you know, than through just air. Um, the vibrations occur, uh, are louder, the vibrations are louder and the sound travels better if there's you know, some sort of medium like consolidation or fluid. Um, egophony, the patient says E, E, E. We call these E to A changes. If, the, if there's consolidation or, or um, you know, effusions, pleural effusions, you might, as the patient says E, you're going to hear A, A, A. So we call those E to A changes. The last one is whispered pectriloquy. Pe sorry, whispered pectriloquy. Um, normally, words will be faint and indistinct, kind of like bronchophony. You might not hear them at all. Um, if you hear them loud and clear, then that can indicate an abnormal, um, an abnormal uh, occurrence or condition. My favorite of all these, the ones with the most validation, is the egophony, so the E to A changes. So if you have to pick one, pick egophony. All right, just a couple notes about pediatric patients. Um, the number of alveoli increases rapidly during that first two years of life and then kind of slows down by about eight years of life. So um, there's a lot of chest growth in kiddos. Um, in infants, their head circumference is bigger than their chest. Their head is bigger than their chest. By the time they're toddlers, though, their chest becomes bigger than their head. Um, so you can, you know, that's, I mean, that's why kids, when they're babies, have a hard time sitting up, right? They're top heavy, they're head heavy, they're kind of lead with their heads and their heads kind of fall all over the place. Uh, the thorax in kiddos is more rounded than in adults. They look a little bit more barrel-chested, um, but they're not. <laughs> the lung sounds are more easily transmitted also. So the, the chest wall is thin. There's very little musculature. So you can almost put your stethoscope anywhere on the body and listen to lung sounds in these little kiddos. You'll still want to inspect and observe, look for breathing rate, pattern, work of breathing, the chest contour. You'll still want to palpate for tactile fremitus. You can still auscultate for breath sounds. Um, note that they'll be louder, they'll be harsher than in adults. Um, and then um, you're going to hear some of, you know, those breath sounds almost anywhere where you check. Here is um, just a, a brief little video of uh, my son a couple of years ago, back when he was adorable. Um, he doesn't look super sick here because this is the middle of the night and I think he's sleep deprived and giddy. But um, you can hear the strider when he's coughing and then you can hear the croup cough. Croup is a very um, common childhood uh, viral cough that um, has this classic sort of, they call it a seal barking cough. Um, so here, take a listen. Okay, whoops, I'm not sure what I did. But anyway, let's see if I can play this for you. <laughs> 
So that is a very classic croup sounding cough, um, that kind of harsh, kind of seal barky cough that they call it. Um, and then you can also hear that strider, that kind of work of breathing um, that that is pretty classic with croup as well. So, okay, that, that uh, finishes up our lung and thorax examination.